Hello and welcome to this session on lockdown learning and brands. Um, uh, my name is Lucy Gill. I'm your moderator for this session. Um, I work in children's apps, uh, helping lots of companies to um, develop learning apps. Um, uh, and I'm joined today by um, three wonderful speakers. Um, by Craig um, Glenn Day from the Guinness World Records. He's the editor in, editor in chief um, uh, and has been there since 2002, I believe. Um, and he's going to have a talk uh, to us a little bit about Guinness World Records and what they've been doing. Um, I'm then joined by Helen uh, Fultz, from, uh, who is head of BBC Education, um, who can tell us all about the amazing work that the BBC have been doing with their bite-size uh, daily lessons and, um, and other offerings. Um, uh, and then I've also here got Clark Stacey from Wildworks. Um, he's the co-founder and CEO, um, and he is is responsible for Animal Jam and the wonderful things they've done, including STEM learning and a sort of social um, platform, uh, online playgrounds platform. So um, we will start off. Um, I should also say before we get into the discussion um, that if you have questions, please can you submit those through the Q&A heart icon that you should see at the top right of your screen. Uh, we'll answer as many of those as we can uh, towards the end of the session. Um, we also have a change maker video that's going to run towards the end of the session. Um, this focuses on climate change in the media and education. We hope you'll be able to stay for that. We'll also open up the chat function for 30 minutes of back chat after the session is over. Um, and uh, uh, I'm hoping that uh, some of our speakers from the session will be able to join us for that half hour. So first of all, um, uh, we're obviously going to be talking a lot about how um, the different people here and their brands have been involved with learning um, and how this has happened in lockdown and uh, the future of this. But we're going to start off with Craig. So Craig, I think you've got a video to, um, to show us and maybe you can introduce yourself and um, then go through that. And then we've got some questions for you after that. Yes. So, hello, hello everyone. Um, these are always weird, aren't they? Because there's no, there's absolutely no response feedback you get from anyone. So, it's speaking into the void. But hello, everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm the editor in chief. So, my job is to compile the book, really, to uh, and presumptuously assume that you know exactly what the Guinness World Records offering is. But we're an annual book. We do it every year, uh, despite people always ask us, "Is it every year?" Yes. Um, and we are effectively one book, but we have other products, um, physical and uh, service related. Um, and I think, yeah, if you just slow the video, it'll give us a little taste of what we've been doing of late. Um, then I'll get on some of the history of the company and how we've been touching on education. Records title for the world's oldest vomit. It's 160 million years old and came out the mouth of an ichthyosaur. You can tell it's sick because that's what's left of its last meal. Luckily, it's fossilized so it doesn't really smell.
that's fantastic, Thank Trace. You. That looks uh, yeah. there's a lot of a lot of content in there. Lots of different things you guys have obviously been doing. Yes, and excuse the plug, the shameless plug for the uh, twenty twenty one book. Um, but it's almost worth noting just on that actually that it looks much younger, arguably than we've ever gone before on the cover because because of the the fact that it's marketed so strongly towards kids that we wanted to have a cover that was very appealing. Um, so it's very different for what we normally do. Um, if you go into the next slide, I'll give you a quick rundown of who we are. So we, we started obviously about 65 years ago. Um, and the idea came around because of an argument. Uh, no one could decide on a shooting party, which was the fastest game bird in Europe. And so Hugh Beaver, who was the chairman of the Guinness um, Brewery, realized that would be, people would be arguing all over the world about things like who is the tallest man, who is the highest played football player. And there were no reference books that really could answer that. I mean, you had Encyclopedia Britannica, which is this epic, huge thing, which is obsessed with saints, the lives of the saints. You know, who cares? Tell me something useful. So Sir so Hugh had this idea that maybe he could help sell him more Guinness. Obviously, he was, that's his job. He wanted to sell more beer. And so commissioned Ross and Norris McWhorter um, to compile a book. Really, he was thinking more of a pamphlet that he could give free to pubs. The idea being that if you're in the pub and there's an argument about to happen, you, um, you take the book, the Guinness book off the shelf, and you turn that heat of argument into the light of knowledge, which is the lovely phrase they used in the introduction. And they produced this sort of very basic um, first edition. This is the first edition purely just pretty much solidly text throughout, had one colour photograph. Um, there's the one colour photograph. Smiths hated it. I think they ordered uh, six copies. There we go, one colour picture. That one is Everest. <laughs> Smiths were like, nah, we'll take six. And we thought, well, six thousand, six hundred, no, six. We wanted six copies. Um, by the end of the week, they'd ordered thousands it was that year's christmas bestseller in 1955 and it stayed pretty much the same book for many years and it wasn't until probably the late 60s where we started to get a sense that it was actually a family product because people were first of all stealing it from the pubs um so guinness started to sell the book in stores to stop people stealing it um but also that it had a very strong family appeal because the huge the vast spectrum of topics it covers means there's something of interest to everyone and that's still a policy we have today to cover the widest possible spectrum of topics um, and a bit like a Christmas selection box you might not like all the bits in it but some bits you will really like it's very shareable uh, it's very affordable it's a nice Christmas gift so it, it works really well in the family sphere and then it probably wasn't in it was probably the BBC, I think, who picked up on the fact that it's very appealing for kids. And the BBC basically stole the idea to do record breakers. So in 1972, I think it was, uh, record breakers appeared on TV and it very quickly shifted um, the demographic of who was actually a core reader of this book. It still stays family and it's um, still um, very wide, but it became much more with the kid in mind with and i think families have always trusted the book to be stealth educational because it's going to have something that will teach you about the world um i mean it's a very um it's very wide-ranging and um there's always something that you won't reject so readers who pick it up will find something um we i think the bookseller told us it was the most stolen book from libraries uh, so we can give ourselves our own record for this. Um, and then we started thinking, how do we then target the kids? So we, as Guinness Publishing, as it was Guinness Superlatives, started looking at options. And on the screen, you'll see some of the uh, some of the publishing that we've done ourselves in-house, aimed specifically um, either at children or at learning and education. And, and we're not experts on these topics. So ultimately what we realized that the best way to succeed in reaching kids is to partner with publishers and educational experts to create the content, take our content, which we have this huge oversupply of. We get about a thousand applications um, a month. Um, now, well, about a hundred, yeah, a hundred a week, maybe, I think at the minute. 
so we've probably gone a bit down. Um, so we have all these records and we don't know what to do with them. So we have published one book a year. And then if you go to the next slide, you'll see some of the licensed publishing that we've done with educational pub. No, sorry, this is our, our own first as well. Yeah, so we've done a science book, the idea of how can you turn um, record breaking into science? Because uh, everything is science, isn't it? So you can look at the science of um, what happens to the top man. Like, what is the science? What's the biology and the anatomy going on? Um, but also giving kids a chance to take part in some record breaking themselves. So uh, we partnered with Orbax and Pepper, who are these two guys. Um, Orbax is, in fact, uh, a lecturer in physics at the University of Guelph, but has this alter ego as a WWE wrestler and torture performer. Um, anyway, he, the kids love him because he's, he's that mad uncle. I think we, we fill that slot of being the naughty uncle at Christmas who tells you things that he shouldn't be telling you. Um, we, we've had our own attempts at going into the education. Is that something Sorry, that's um, in lockdown that you've been um, involved with the science side? Have you have you found that uh, aspect has been a big thing within lockdown? Um, well, I think the doing the doing the things at home aspect of it is important to us um, because that's engaging, much more engaging than just reading about content. So, um, if you want to learn about anatomy, you know, it's a bit like me, doesn't it? Um, we can give you challenges to do at home. You would just download activity sheets uh, and try things, whether it's experiments you can do at home um, or records you can attempt. So for us, um, going into that is almost what we do anyway, because we encourage people to do record breaking at home um, and in the process learn. I think that's the key is that you will learn. Everything for us is learning, I think, um, because I think when you're that eight to 12 year old age range, is it's when you think, really begin to twig that you are not the center of the universe and that there's other world around you. And what we do is we put limits on that and say, these are the extremes of the world that you live in. So play around in that world and experiment and see where you fit in. This is very um, much an educational um, tool, I think, to discover for yourself what's going on in the world. Um, Absolutely. So I think on the next so on the next slide, so if you swap to the next one, you'll see the, um, these are some of the other educational partnerships we've made um, in terms of what we do, uh, approaching very specific, so Scholastic, Rising Stars, Carson DeLosa, HarperCollins, uh, doing very specific school curriculum-based work. Um, and again, some of that, like the quizzing, has worked online. So we've taken, you see the mind-bending quiz pad there, so we can take that on to an online platform. So we've used Ben, uh, from our TV show, Officially Amazing, uh, Ben Shires, who's, um, who's been hosting quizzes for us on TikTok and Facebook. Um, again, just to try and get the fun, to find the fun aspects of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting these, you mentioned... Things. It was interesting you mentioned TikTok. The um, I saw that in your video as well. It, it's um, that's obviously quite a is a, a presumably a new platform to, for you to be working on. What what made you move into TikTok and how successful has that been? Um, I think it's just going where we know the kids are. I mean, it's, it, it blew up TikTok from almost. I think it was musically, wasn't it? It came out of almost yeah. nowhere, and, and it's a very positive platform. It's, it seems very um, life affirming. And it very much targets the kids that we are trying to focus the book at. So even, even though the book is written for a family, 16-year-old reading age, you know that the marketing is targeted at the TikTok age and the TikTok generation, as they'll probably be. Uh, and it's also a family platform, TikTok, which is I also love about it. You see parents and kids interacting. Um, and they appreciated us bringing that educational or that stealth education into the, into the platform. Uh, so we've done a few things. We've done Museum at Home, which is the embarrassing um, vomit. Uh, there's been a few elements of that. Uh, we've also um, hosted EduTalk sessions because they, they are looking to up their educational content specifically. So I did an hour-long chat about record-breaking and um, how to learn from records uh, for TikTok. So it's been very, for us, it's been great. And we are one of the, I think there was, I mean, my favorite stat from that is, the video of me with the tallest and shortest man was the most watched in the UK and something like the second biggest in the world in terms of a brand that we've done it 
incredibly well on this platform because it works with our content. It's very short form, punchy. Um, you know, each each element in the book is probably one or two sentences long, and, and kids. I think that's why kids engage with the brand because it is small pieces of things. And we've been looking at so doing, creating to... record content. Sorry, go on. I'm going to I can go on sorry, for hours. Uh, yeah, I was going to say I need to bring Helen in in a minute. But um, uh, if you were to give one uh, tip to who are considering TikTok, particularly because that seems like a really innovative thing to have got involved in from a learning perspective, if you were giving a tip to people who are considering that as a platform, what would you say is the the best lesson you could pass on to them? I mean, I said get to know it very well. We're lucky to have someone who's almost full-time job, well, there's about two and a half people whose full-time job is to, is to host our social media content. But get to know the platform and, and its idiosyncrasies and what bits work on it. Otherwise, you're just putting out content that no one cares about. So you have to try and slot in exactly with the, you know, it should resonate with what's there, I think. And also get to know, get to know the platform and the, and the platform managers very well so that you're, you're working with them to provide content that they want to promote other because you can just disappear so we've been very lucky museum at home was curated to the top of the list so the guinness world records content is at the very top of the list because we know them well and have worked with them uh, to deliver what they want um otherwise yeah. you, there's a habit of just pushing stuff out and it just disappears into a chasm great that's really helpful right i'm going to bring um helen in now so helen she's he head of bbc education um and i have watched in awe over the last few months of what you've done um in the bbc and you know to have actually created such a vast amount of content and made it all available and uh, you know across so many different platforms it's the sort of thing that uh, most companies could only dream of doing over several years and you guys seem to have um pulled that off in a very short space of time now i know there must have been quite a lot of content that you had already and and as well as the newest stuff but i'd love to um to hear from you a bit more about that journey um but perhaps uh, to start with i think you have a video um that you were going to show us Do you want to start with that and tell it give us a bit of background yeah. yeah that would be great why don't we play the video and we can go from there hello i'm karim and this is bite size daily what do you call a can opener that doesn't work a can opener it's going to be good times, tables. You know what I did there? What that came from? This boy Drew keeps cracking my workplace. What shall I do? Let's say I've got £50 in my bank account. You've fallen on hard time since earlier when you had 500 I'm More realistic, if I'm being honest. Can I test my buzzer, please? Negative and positive numbers really are everywhere, aren't they? You can learn from a packet of burgers. I am the last ninja. Um, so that's a bit of a flavour of um, our bite-sized daily broadcasts out of daily lessons uh, that were uh, are available on iPlayer and the Red Button. Uh, and uh, every day we had uh, six 20-minute shows uh, for across all age groups. Um, uh, also on uh, online, you can see here is our Bite Size daily offer uh, on the BBC Bite Size website, uh, and that's. Um, Every day we'd have 30 lessons uh, for years one to 10, uh, in English, maths, and another subject every day. Uh, so that kind of gives you the flavor of, of, the, of the breadth of the, of the core offer. Um, we, we also have done some teacher talks films on iPlayer, which are sort of teachers teaching core concepts in English and maths. Um, for the parents out there, we've given a parent's toolkit. So uh, we can answer some of those questions around homeschooling and how to use Bite Size uh, on social. Or well, we've done uh, lots on Bite Size Instagram for uh, you know teenagers, year 10s, where they can ask teachers directly questions. Um, and, and it was a, you know, it has been a, a bit of a BBC, uh, across the BBC moment, because uh, as well as what we've done in BBC education, you know, we've worked with iPlayer, we've worked with BBC Sounds uh, and we've also had programming on BBC Four uh, every evening for sort of older older students so what we really wanted to do uh, was give a, a you know a, a, a bigger package as possible that was flexible so it could work uh, either for you viewing or online it could work whenever you needed it amazing um, and, and I gather the take-up's been quite incredible of, of how many viewers you've actually had um, am I yes, right that really it's something like three, 
three million tuned in on the first day or I, I don't know how that's flowed since then. So what? So online, uh, every week, we have about 3 million unique users using our content online. And then on iPlayer, um, so far, we've had over 5 million downloads of the, of the daily lessons on broadcast. So we're really delighted, uh, you know, with how uh, the audience have used it and how they've responded to it. Um, and, you know, we've been really grateful as well for the input from sort of teachers uh, both in making all of this we always work with teachers um, but also them recommending it to their students as part of their kind of homeschooling package so yeah we're really, really pleased um, of, of the way it's done but it was a bit of a mammoth task uh, you know as you say Lucy we've got a lot of content there already uh, and we did particularly online do a lot of curation but all the broadcast was was made from scratch uh, and curating those lessons so they really make sense step by step for either a student or for a student and parents if we're looking at this in the primary space was quite a big big feat uh we had about five we've had about five we had about five weeks sort of planning time to turn all that around uh and only about a week in the office before the bbc went on lockdown and we all sort of the slide there shows people working from home and and sort of uh, dealing with putting all this together in a remote way, which in, in itself was quite a challenge. But we're really yeah, pleased, bet. really pleased with the response from everybody. Uh, it's been it's been great. Fantastic. Um, and, it, and in terms of um, how the uh, schools have been involved, you talked a little bit about making sure you've got educators. So is that something that's always part of your process that you have the same teachers that are always get involved or have you had to set something new up for this particular process? So, so, um, education all the content we make in education is all all done in consultation with teachers and teaching consultants and that's just part of our our process uh and, and we we find the right people for, for the right for the right kind of content depending on what it is so we haven't got a sort of a set list um what we did when when we sort of had a set that schools were closing we got some research very quickly into the field with you know just teachers on the ground not necessarily our teacher consultants but teach just teachers to kind of get a sense of well what would be useful for for you uh similarly what would be useful for parents um and uh We've worked with them all the way along the line. And also what's been really great, uh, which we've been able to do much more on the broadcast than maybe we would do normally online, is teachers have been stars of the show, you know, um, on the broadcast on Bite Size Daily. Yeah, obviously, there's great you know, talent there uh, with Krim and Katie. Um, but teachers are the people who are teaching because they're the ones who can do it best. Um, so we've had a, you know, it's been really great to be able to sort of showcase the wonderful teaching skills we've got across this country. Um, and, and to mix those in with, you know, big BBC names as well has really given it a quite a nice, you know, a nice flavour. You know, we've been delighted to have, uh, you know, David Attenborough na narrating our science and geography content. Uh, Danny Dyer's done a bit of uh, history. Um, uh, David Walliams, Stephen Fry, saw Oti Mabusi on the video. We've done a kind of a reading club. So that's been really good to get people, people sort of uh, engaged uh, and, and people tuning in as well. So it's been a really good mix. Absolutely. And I mean, obviously, being the BBC, um, you have access to a lot of these people and, you know, that that helps. But what would you um, do you feel you've learned that might be valuable to other people working in the sector in, in, in terms of setting this kind of process up and, and engaging with this kind of audience? Well, I, what I'd say, you know, it, it, thinking back you know when you're doing it you're not really thinking at all you're just sort of doing it but you know now you know we're still we're still putting stuff out because it's still the sum, summer term uh, in england and wales so we're still putting stuff out but we're starting to reflect now one thing that we have done that we haven't done in the past uh is uh, work with a lot of partners uh on our, our content on bite size so We've curated content from Teach, BBC Teach, BBC Bite Size, but also lots of partner content. So we've worked with uh, BISA, the industry for, for education, um, the commercial education industry. So we worked with uh, Pearson, White Rose Mass, uh, you know, Sam Learning. They, they've put content into these curated lessons. And then we've also worked with other you know, other, other organisations like the RSC. We did a great Shakespeare week, Science Museum, did a great Science Week. And I think that's been what's been big for us is is sort of um, working with lots of other people to, to kind of create a really strong education piece. Uh, and then I think, you know, um, one thing that we've really learned, and I 
I hope or we'll see what happens in the autumn term is our relationship with the parents of primary school kids uh, is really good because I think primary school you know not that we don't want to do homeschooling forever and you know but, but I think we've all you know I certainly wouldn't um but I think it's given <laughs> parents an opportunity with with the right content that you can help your child uh, learn at home and, and feel part of that process and that's something we'll definitely want to build on more in the future okay and then just a final question before I move on to Clark um do you how do you predict things are going to change come September I mean we're not quite sure where we're going and you know what what's going to happen to the digital learning industry and and the BBC education you know bite-sized daily brands everything you've built up where do you see that going so I think you're quite right we don't quite know what the autumn term will bring um you know we uh we know you know kids will be going back to school that's that's the plan but it will be an autumn term like no other uh because you will have uh kids who need to catch up on certain content uh, concepts you'll have the well-being piece of being away from school and, and coming back into school you know teachers will be very stretched uh, and i think um you know parents will be wanting to make sure that their kids are, are kind of um uh, getting back into school life as it was and then obviously if you're a year 10 uh, or a year 11 your exams and your GCSEs are, are quite tight on you when you've probably had four months of of a different type of learning um, so I think it'll be a very interesting autumn term I do think and I do hope that online learning will play a part in, in that uh, and I know one of our kind of plans is uh, to make our content as easily navigable for teachers as we can as they plan out their school autumn curriculum and what things can help uh, enhance what they're going to do in the classroom or perhaps that kids can do at home to catch up. Uh, I think we'll also have a, a, an offer in primary maybe for parents so if you've got a bit of that kind of co-learning habit or you, you want to do a bit more or there'll be content there that you can do uh, with your kids at home. And as always, we'll be offering our brilliant kind of, this is what you need to know to pass your GCSEs content that we do so well. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Helen. And we'll come back to you with questions in a little bit. But um, let me move on to Clark now. So Clark Stacey is um, the co-founder and CEO of Wildworks, um, who, uh, which is the home of Animal Jam, um, uh, which is a wonderful um, online playground, which has sort of combined social gaming and uh, education, particularly in the STEAM area. I think that's right, Clark, isn't it? Um, uh, that's true. Though. We've, so we never call it an educational game, though. But uh... But you're but you're very right you know educational game that's that's a kiss of death with kids so we, we pretend that it's just pure entertainment it's learning by stealth i i think that's the, the phrase that seems right. to come up a lot these days um so perhaps it, i think you have do you have a video um to, or some slides to show us to start with do you want to start off by um yeah we, we do we'd uh, we have a, a we have a short video highlighting yeah, highlighting some of the, the recent educational content that's gone into the game. So why don't we look at that first? Great. Hey, Animal Jammers, Dr. Brady here, and I'm in southwestern China in the Bana Rainforest, the home of the last wild herd of Asian elephants. Hey Jammers, it's Gabby Wild. Today we're going to be learning a little bit about elephants and specifically, we'll be learning about the amazing trunk of the elephant. Hey Jammers, got a question from Juniper Winged Master who wants to know, how do jellyfish sting? Fantastic. So yeah, it looks like there's a, ho a whole lot of content in there. Um, uh, do you want to give us a little bit of an overview of the learning side of the business and and, uh, and what you're trying to achieve and why that's important to your brand? Sure, sure. So Animal Jam uh, originally launched almost 10 years ago. It'll be 10 years in, in August. Uh, so we've had time to build up quite an educational content library. And the intention with Animal Jam from the beginning was that it is uh, it is an educational 
uh, game, but it's an entertainment game first. You know, we don't uh, we don't have formal pedagogy in there. We don't do testing to uh, establish baseline uh, learnings for teachers. Really, it's based on the fact that every child has a favorite animal and they love to learn about their favorite animal and demonstrate their knowledge to you. Uh, so we want to give them the ability to drill down on things that interest them. And one thing that we found over that 10 years is something that really interests them is the, the work that actual working animal scientists in the field. Uh, because a lot of our audience is girls, we try to uh, focus on working women scientists to show these careers as, uh, as attainable and something that they could uh, see themselves doing. Um, but beyond that, we have a great deal of, uh, of educational ebooks, of facts, animal related science video. Uh, everything educational associated with the game is free content that kids can uh, can access anytime. And there's a uh, an adjunct website uh, called AG Academy that has downloadable uh, activities and and homeschool resources. Great. So you're an an app and an and an online. Those are your your two platforms. Is that right? It is yes. It's uh, it's playable you know, both through a desktop computer and on uh, mobile apps. Okay. And how have things changed during lockdown? What's been your strategy for that? We find the kids use Animal Jam not unlike an adult social network. So they spend a lot of time in there chatting with friends. It is a safe social environment for, for kids that their parents oversee and uh, has some very <clears throat> strict guardrails around uh, chat content and that. Uh, and we protect their their anonymity and personal information. Um, what we're seeing during lockdown is what we typically see uh, on a day with a heavy snowstorm in the in the UK or uh, or the US when kids are home from school and they're uh, they're playing Animal Jam because uh, their parents need something to occupy them. This has been the longest snow day ever for us. Uh, <laughs> what, we're, what we're seeing is that kids are using it. Uh, much like parents are using their social media to keep in touch with friends during this time. Uh, so kids are playing, uh, you know, 60 to as much as 80 minutes per day on, on average. And they're spending most of that time uh, just chatting with friends. That, and that's really interesting. Um, I, I was saying to you before this call that as, as well as the work I do with apps, I actually often give talks to parents on um, managing uh, digital content for kids. And this uh, aspect of social um, interaction over digital has always been very contentious, particularly with COPPA compliance and GDPR. Um, it feels like um, uh, platforms like yours are enabling that to work in a safe safe way and perhaps lockdown is going to move the whole social side of children's gaming forward um, a huge amount. Do you, do you feel that's, um, that's correct? Do you think I'm right in that? And, and what do you think has been the key for you um, to making that work safely and successfully? Yeah, I, I certainly hope that's the case. I think um, I, I think what a lot of parents are discovering is that uh, kid-friendly games aren't necessarily designed or purpose-built for kids. They are still adult games, and the the social features in them have you know, uh, adult guardrails on them. That is, there is no uh, filtering around language, around uh, personal information, around hate speech. Uh, so parents uh, might, you know, let their kids socialize in a game that they assume is is safe for kids, and find out that it's not really. Um, Animal Jam doesn't use an age gate. There is no adult version of Animal Jam where the the chat filters and and other protections are are lowered. Uh, we use some pretty sophisticated heuristics to make sure that kids are not exchanging things like phone numbers, addresses, you know, real names. Uh, and I think that is the key to the success is that we feel like we have a covenant with parents to uh, to have this be a playground that they can uh, let their kids run around in for an hour without uh, having to worry about them. Fantastic. And where do you see this um, moving in future uh, more generally? In, I, I see that uh, with both education and, and gaming, I'm seeing a, an amazing awakened interest in the kids space uh, that, that hasn't been there before. I think that a lot of children's uh, app makers have been 
uh, or, or just general game developers have been scared of the, of the kids space because of COPPA, GDPR, all these other regulations. And they've certainly been frightened of anything that uh, could be associated with kids' social interaction online because that's just fraught with peril. Um, over the, the past uh, 10 years or so, we've, uh, we've invested quite a bit in finding a way to do kids' social in games safely and in a way that, that protects them. I think that's going to be a much bigger part of uh, both games and educational apps for kids going forward. Yeah, that sounds absolutely right. Um, and in terms of the sort of, you talked about the uh, scientists and, and bringing the real um, real scientists into the game and that being so important. And I'm a firm believer, I've mentioned you before, I'm a STEM ambassador and, and really keen to um, encourage all types of children from different ethnic backgrounds, from um, both boys and girls. Um, what do you think has works well in your game um, to achieve that? What do you think the, the key is to make that work well? It, it, the key is is obviously that kids identify with animals. Kids have favorite animals, and that's sort of a gateway into a lot of uh, a lot of science, as you know. Uh, if you can get kids interested in that, they want to learn more about habitats and ecology and uh, and everything that uh, that affects the life cycle of the animals that they love. So uh, the animals are are kind of the tip of the spear for introduction to a lot of other uh, steam related topics. And uh, I think for us, it's been educational partnerships that have helped us put a lot of this content into the game. Um, another uh, important part of what we do is uh, species and habitat conservation. So we work with, uh, with partners that I think try to communicate to kids that there are things that they can do, whether they live in uh, the center of London, New York City, or if they live out in the country, uh, there are ways to encounter nature uh, right outside their door, and there are also things that they can do, practical things, uh, to, uh, to help mitigate the damage uh, of uh, climate change and to protect uh, species diversity in the future. Okay, that sounds fantastic. Right, should we um, bring everyone um, back together for um, questions? We've got sort of about 10 minutes or so uh, before we need to go over to the um, uh, change maker video. So, um, first of all, I've had some questions coming through on here, and then I also have some of my own. Um, I have one specific question for you, Helen. Um, talking about how can writers get involved with BBC Bite Size and BBC Education. So I wonder whether that's a quick one to cover off first. Sure. So um, we work with a lot of uh, educational consultants in our writing of our curriculum offer. Uh, and then we work with, we have a support offer, which sort of covers everything. Uh, you say sort of from exam stress to mental health to, you know, um, to a real range of subjects. And we're always looking for uh, writers who uh, can write, you know, from their experience in certain areas. Um, so, you know, the best thing to do in terms of, a, you know, uh, from a writer's perspective is very happy for you to get in contact with me and then I can uh, get you in touch with the teams. In terms of our, uh, you know, our normal video content uh, that goes through a, a, a standard commissioning process. Um, but I think what everybody's asking is that kind of the written part of it um so it's it's just uh, get in touch with me and i'll get you in touch with the right people uh and then if there are opportunities we can get in touch but we are as always we're looking for writers who can who either got educational experience or have experience in those areas of support or careers fantastic thanks helen um and then a question to all of you but let's start um with craig um how has lockdown affected parents and teachers and um, children's take up of digital learning do you think what do you think has changed in the way that they're interacting with digital learning and and how do you think this will change post lockdown well it's certainly forced it hasn't it there's been not a lot of choice i think um but i think what it's probably done is reveal to the parents what that there is that breadth out there it's um you know, as we said before everything i think everything is educational it's just finding how to turn that around into something that is helping with the growth generally of the child. Uh, so whether it's sort of particularly curriculum based or not, I think isn't that important. Um, for us as well, it's about being having much more chance to engage with people directly um, to find out 
what they're wanting from us. Um, maybe before we'd do school visits anyway, we would tend to solicit ideas from parents uh, and schools each year in terms of research. But um, by being able to touch on them much more consistently, I think it's allowed us to learn a lot more about who our readers are and about what they want. So it's, for us, it's been a great thing. I think we'll carry on with lots of these things that have developed the idea of kids doing more uh, hands-on record attempts. Our educational yeah. uh, educational element is something that we would definitely want to carry on with after this, um, if, after the lockdown ends. Yeah, it's like, um, I don't know how other people feel about this, but I've always felt that, um, particularly in the UK, and I'm not sure what it's like as much in the US, but that parents are quite like nervous about digital historically they've kind of felt guilty about screen time and guilty about digital and felt that 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 maybe it's more about fun and not about learning and maybe lockdown has forced them to realize quite how much digital can support their learning i don't know whether other people agree with that comment that it's sort of changed parents mindset around um digital is that something you feel has changed for you craig um sorry clark that um uh, that parents are seeing these kinds of games slightly differently than they have in the past? I, I hope so. I, you know, children learn through play, and uh, we, we understand that well in, in the physical realm. We're just beginning to understand it, and parents are, are mistrustful of the idea that that can happen in the digital realm as well. Uh, I think what parents are experiencing is that there is uh, there are a lot of apps out there, and the quality varies uh, widely. And you know, the the effectiveness of learning tools varies widely. Uh, so they're gravitating to trusted brands like some of those represented uh, here on on this panel. Uh, and my hope is that we see more innovation coming out of this, uh, particularly when it comes to incorporating uh, play with with learning and have that be you know, more of a, a driver for instruction than not just drilling in, in facts and things. And what about you, Helen? And so in terms of from a kind of BBC perspective, I guess what you're doing tends to be more curriculum focused, whereas uh, Craig and Clark are perhaps doing more of the learning by stealth and the kind of engaging in, in a wider sense. But, but your sort of stuff is very much supporting the curriculum. How do you see that moving forwards now? And, and how do you think the attitudes to that amongst the audience, the parents, the teachers, the children, um, how do you think that will evolve? Or what's your prediction in, the, in that sense? So I think, um, you know, I think teachers um, obviously have had to do an amazing job over over lockdown and, and have to adapt very quickly. Um, but I think it's given them a chance to look at all the digital tools that are out there uh, and maybe give them confidence. Uh, you know, everybody needs training and more, more, more kind of support, but in confidence in using some digital, more digital content in the classroom uh, and feeling confident to point their pupils to do uh you know sort of that digital learning at home um and i think from a parent's perspective as slightly said it before is that that we that that world of the of digital learning has been opened up a little bit more, particularly at an you know at a, an earlier age as well. Uh, we're on bite size are um, experimenting with more games. You know, um, they all have really clear learning outcomes. You know, we are tied to to the curriculum and those learning outcomes, but we're now trying we, we're trying to do it in a, in a way that. The audience wants to consume that, you know, if there's brilliant content out there uh, that has an educational feel to it, we sort of want our kind of the, the more harder education to have an entertaining feel to it. Um, so I do think that that um, it could be a moment in time where parents do want to get a little bit more involved in uh, the digital side of learning from home. You know, it doesn't have to necessarily just be reading the, the, the reading book, not that that's a bad thing at all, but you could do something else as well. Uh, and I think that's what perhaps this has opened up. Um, and, you know, the wealth of stuff out there, it shows that there's lots of things that teachers can use uh, to, to help um, enhance their teaching. Uh, and they sort of know what works for their pupils best so they can curate what they need as well, as long as it's available to them. 
And what I find really interesting, I've worked in this space for a while, um, is that uh, in terms of, um, we, I've often worked with clients who either consider themselves to be curriculum learning and very much involved, or people who sit on the opposite and go, oh no, we're fun. We can't do learning because we're fun. And it feels like that this has sort of forced a bigger convergence between the two, that you can have fun and, and have engaging content as, as Clark and Craig have talked about and be engaging. And it sounds like, Helen, that's the sort of direction that you're, you know, you're doing the hardcore curriculum, the proper learning outcomes, but that there are ways to evolve that into being a fun experience that could be used in the home regardless of lockdown. Yeah, Brilliant. I think so. I, I, the, the word that, that keeps coming to my mind is positive. Uh, you know, uh, how, how can we make positive content, con content that uh, is engaging um, and even though you maybe you're doing a subject that's it's not your favourite, uh, I won't name any, uh, but you know, at least doing it, because uh, I'd always go for maths, which is bad. Um, it, you know, you'd, you, you're doing it in a positive way. So it might not be your favorite subject, but the way you've learned about it online just makes you go, oh, I get it now. And, and actually that's helped yeah. me. So I think that's the word that I, that's my favorite word at the moment. I have a uh, well, quick question for you, Helen, specific one here. Um, it says, will any of the new funds be used to simulate um, the BAM inclusion? Uh, e.g. for writers. So is, is there is there stuff we're doing for for the ethnic groups and um, uh, specifically within what you do? Yes, so um, it, oh, it, it's, it's uh, what we're doing uh, in education and in an online space that uh, we're making a, a very, uh, you know, we are making a commitment to um, uh, include much more uh, uh, black and ethnic minority uh, content, looking at the curriculum, how we can widen out the history curriculum, what we can do in citizenship, and then also how we um, truly kind of uh, portray a just society and have those people in there. So although it's not, a, it's not part of that funding, we are pulling some, we are putting some funding in to do those things. Uh, we're looking at it both on bite-sized support, but also, and this will be a longer term uh, plan, uh, but we do want it to be a sustained plan uh, on what we can do in the curriculum space, what we can do on teach and what we can also do on bite-sized uh, to make sure we are uh, being the place where um, everybody can educate themselves about our true history and what a just society should look like. Fantastic. And Craig, I was going to ask you, um, I'm aware that some of uh, what you've been involved with has used some augmented reality um, and, and games aspects in there. I'm really interested to hear a little bit more about um, what you've done and how that's supported learning um, at home and I guess potentially in the classroom as well. Yeah, I mean, part of our success originally was the fact that we went on screens, which is very interesting to get that feedback from parents the book provides a non-screen experience that's definitely changing as people come to learn what this potential of this is and the best example i think we have is augmented reality uh, so where you might have had 3d specs in the past very old school te old school technology now we can use really, really bring, bring things live and um we, we've partnered with people this day and augmented reality. um we've done it for a couple of weeks now what you saw in the video at the beginning was um, a guide to the solar system. So it's a trip through the solar system that you would take virtually. Um, and basically, we will look at any any trick in the book to get kids to pick up um, reading. We don't care what they're reading on. We don't care um, what they're reading particularly, but anything that we can do to get kids to pick up. So whether it's glow in the dark, which we've tried in the past, or fold out pages or 3D glasses, uh, and now augmentified Augmentify it, sorry, of binding us with this great content, um, which again, just it's that hook you need just to get the kids interested just enough. And you can, there's so much, much more richness and depth I think you can have from uh, augmented reality that you don't get from a, a more flat reading of the book, which is fairly straightforward. Um, so I think it's the response we've had has been fantastic. Kids just love it. Parents can't quite understand how it works which is good as well. I think that makes the kids feel good about themselves. Um, and anything like games, so we're developing a game you saw again in that video was, um, we have, we've created the character in the last couple of years called Ali Zing. And we're trying to use him to engage. So in this case, 
um, in the game is that he's lost the records and has to then kids have to go and collect the records. Um, so it's a, a way again of engaging directly with kids and getting them to 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 stealth for that growth mindset really of just sort of saying everything yeah. is contributing to your the shaping of you as a human being. Uh, and we we all want to avoid right. it being curriculum based, right. um, just to stop it being seen as schoolwork. Absolutely. And one um, one other quick question for you, Craig. In terms of uh, monetization, do you feel that you ca there are significant monetization options through the digital channels, or is the monetization mainly focused on the physical sales still? Um, for us, still the physical book sales. I mean, we have got a very successful YouTube channel, which is obviously helping us, um, and it's, it's, it's you know it contributes a nice little chunk of cash each year. Um, it's just it's trying to shape the content to suit the platform. So educational content isn't that isn't that successful in terms of monetary gain on YouTube, uh, and you and you risk affecting the uh, the algorithm of your other videos how they perform. So it's about finding the right spaces for these things. So for us at the minute, it's not really a priority to 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 earn from this. It's more about to to, to drive people into the brand as an it's a bit of a gateway so it's a, you know it's a gateway drug into learning as well because i think once kids realize they can enjoy learning it becomes a thing you innately do throughout your life and not something that you do it associated with school particularly it just becomes you become naturally curious about the world uh, and we want to okay. encourage that idea of just wanting to know about the world generally um okay by, by, by showing them the potential of the world Absolutely. And Clark, um, a quick question for you on the monetization front as well. How do you find that um, uh, has lockdown changed your approach to monetization of, of Animal Jam? How, how, has it, how has it affected your business model? Well, one of the first things that we thought about in, in March as schools in the U.S. Were, were shutting down was how can we be of service to parents during this period? So uh, we, we monetize primarily through membership. We think that is uh, the most straightforward and, and ethical way to monetize kids in, in apps. Uh, and so we made our, our memberships free for a period there so the kids coming out of school abruptly could still keep in touch with their friends. Uh, what we're finding is uh, during this period that kids are just more engaged and engagement um, is, leads to, to monetization for us. Um, yeah, we uh, we're not one of those game companies that is trying to uh, constantly get kids to make purchases and rack up thousand know, dollar iTunes bills. Uh, we're looking to to cap you know the the potential spend into something that parents can uh, can stomach. Uh, so what we're finding is, I think, I hope anyway, is that we're building some trust in in that audience uh, with the brand. Fantastic. Now, I think, amazingly, the hour has whistled by um, and we have to um, uh, segue into the um, Changemaker video. So we have a Changemaker um, uh, video to show you. Um, if um, and before, before we get to that, if you didn't get a chance to your question to be answered, then please come for the chat afterwards where um, I think uh, some of our speakers will be able to stay on and answer um, those questions uh, for you. Just give us a moment to swap over to the other channel. Um, but um, uh, this uh, time is, is not one young people will, um, uh, it's something that, that young people have a really important thing to say. So what I've got now is a video um, of, from Joe Riddle and his team from the Teach the Future. So if we can play the Changemaker video, that would be fantastic. Thanks very much to our panel. We'll come back in a second. Sometime early last year, I was watching a documentary. It was about drought in Malawi. I found the documentary saddening and shocking, particularly the mention of drought being caused or worsened by climate change. I was shocked to learn that climate change was happening now and even more shocked to discover that it was causing death now. When I began to understand the true severity of the climate crisis, I felt angry that 14 years of education had failed to teach me even the basics on this topic. As a young person growing up into a world that would be greatly affected by climate change, I deserve to be taught about it. This shows strong failure in my education. 
We all ought to be taught the truth about climate change and certainly shouldn't have to discover it through a documentary after being in school for over a decade. And Joe isn't alone here. In fact, a recent survey showed only 4% of students feel they know a lot about the climate crisis. This is something that is going to inevitably affect all of our futures. So we know that the current system is just not good enough anymore. If we want a sustainable future, that figure has to be around 90%. And therefore we need people to be equipped to teach about climate change and sustainability. But three quarters of our teachers feel they haven't received adequate training to educate students on climate change. Young people need to be given the skills to grow up in a world facing massive climate disruption. Whatever subjects they study, whatever school they go to, whatever they go on to do. And this is why we believe that climate crisis education must be liberated from the current subjects in which it's taught and be made the very foundation of education as a whole. With the climate emergency and ecological breakdown being the single greatest threat to the younger generation, Sustainability must be a golden thread running through every available topic, from colonialism in history to the harmful effects of the animal agricultural industry and food technology, and the current suffering in the global south in subjects such as PSHE and politics. By ensuring that all young people have a well-rounded knowledge of the climate crisis, we would therefore be preparing them for their future livelihoods, as no matter if you're a builder or a banker, a farmer or a pharmacist, you can understand the world around you and how you can make a positive impact upon it. As Charlie said, by embedding climate education into every available area within school, we are preparing young people for their future professions. However, the issue of informing the youngest generation on this grave threat extends far further than the traditional classroom setting. In this new age of technology, children are from a young age using devices to stream and watch videos, read books and listen to podcasts and music, all of which create subconscious connections that create lasting opinions about what is conceived to be normal. Teach the future feels that it is important that we also embrace this as part of the new normal for climate education and that this provides not just an awareness but an acknowledgement for the responsibility that we hold as part of our society. We know the media feeds into our daily lives and can adjust the way that we think and act. And whilst the media has a responsibility to provide this extended education, it also needs to be careful in the way it covers the delicate issue of climate change, as there must be recognition for the increasing cases of climate anxiety, especially among adolescents. We need to build a resilient society that's equipped with all of the knowledge and skills needed to deal with the now inevitable impacts of climate change. And making sure that our education system includes this knowledge is the first step forward. Ultimately, we need a Green New Deal, which is a 10-year government-led mobilisation to rapidly phase out fossil fuels whilst also solving the massive inequality problem that we have in the UK. This inequality problem is replicated in our education system, where the current power imbalance means the system is favoured towards more privileged, neurotypical students and it's time that we break down these access restrictions so that we have a more fair and equitable education system for all. Now, due to the current economic recession, we're going to be seeing more government spending. In a way, it's going to act as an economic stimulus to reboot the economy. But we must ensure that decarbonising the economy, decarbonising education establishments and decolonising the education system is a part of this. This new normal needs to encompass climate education in its entirety, but how do we do this and how do we do this well? Teach the Future has three asks which will create a sustainable, productive education system and learning environment for all. The first is a government commissioned review into how the education system prepares students for the climate emergency. The second relates to teaching, with the inclusion of the climate crisis in teacher training and a new professional teaching qualification. The last is the implementation of the English Climate Emergency Education Act, which we wrote and unveiled earlier this year. In schools, this plays out into a constructive atmosphere for both students and teachers, where everyone feels educated and empowered to create change. With 75% of teachers feeling that they haven't received adequate training about climate change, these reforms are vital in ensuring a just and sustainable future. Education is not restricted to classrooms. It is important that we acknowledge this and that a new normal for schooling is inclusive of all learning types so that we can create lasting educational change for all. The engagement of children is vital in the fight against the climate crisis. As we have seen through the Fridays for Future movement, children care deeply about the planet and are alarmed by the effects that climate change will have on their lives and the lives of others. 
Yet we do not understand this crisis sufficiently, as we are not taught about it properly in schools. And our lack of understanding inhibits our potential to take action and understand its severity. We know the media can fill in the blanks that our education system is not providing us with. We have described the profound influence that the media has over children. And we know that if children's media, if their books, their movies and their television focus the narrative around the climate crisis, children would understand this issue from a much younger age and in far more depth. We need you to create a generation that understands the climate crisis and empowers them to take action to create a just and green future. Inspiring words from our change makers there. It's always fa fabulous to hear it from their mouths. So um, just to finish off the session, um, I want to say a huge thank you to BAFTA for once again sponsoring the CMC Changemakers. Uh, Changemakers resonates with the BAFTA's international programme of events and initiatives that support and develop new talent and offers unique access to some of the world's most inspiring people working in the industry. Um, I also wanted to say a huge thank you to our speakers, to Craig and uh, Clark and Helen. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you. We could have carried this on for, for hours and hours. Um, there's so many questions I wanted to ask. And, and I know there are lots of other questions that the audience wanted to ask too. So um, uh, I think most of us are able to, to transfer over to the um, back chat um, now. So that will be opening and be open for the next uh, 30 minutes. Um, uh, and in terms of the rest of the CMC schedule today, there there is no uh, keynote scheduled for today, but if you want to catch up with some notable keynotes of the past, then look at the best of strand in the video on demand list. Four CMC speakers from challenging and inspiring uh, speakers, including poet um, Lem Sisse and um, uh, theatre director Jenny Seeley, recommended and curated by four industry luminaries, including PBS's Linda Simensky and Kay Ben. Ben, Bur ben Bao, uh, former controllers of uh, CBBC, uh, CBBS. Sorry, the uh, the next live session is at eleven o'clock tomorrow, and that looks at how the BFI Young Audiences Content Fund is doing. Um, and that just leaves um, it to me to say thank you again to our speakers and to ask you to join us in the back chat for the next half hour. Thank you very much indeed. Take care.